start today again in the in the same in the same style as yesterday. That I, I want to spend a little bit of time recapping what we did at the end, and I think the end was a little bit more intense, and, and we talked about some things that probably are not familiar to uh, to some of you. So I think it's good to see it a few a few more times. So the topic is really quantum information, and we are going to quantize what um, what Shannon did. Uh, and the whole logic follows follows the two statements that Landau made. And this is always uh, linked back to, to to the guy who actually was a great skeptic when he came to quantum computing. He didn't believe we could ever have a quantum computer, and yet he kind of gave the gave, gave the initial motivation for the whole thing. Um, so one of the ways of talking about it is that uh, is that he would say there is no information without physical systems. So, you know, there is no disembodied information. I mean, this is a nice summary of the fact that I said that mathematics is just a branch of physics. In this case, information theory is a branch of physics, but like I said, my hope is that everything is a branch of physics. The second statement is that there is no dynamics without physical evolution. So the first part of the statement refers to memory in some sense. And the second one says, uh, you can't evolve systems without doing something physical to them. So any information actually has to be fundamentally dependent on your laws of physics. That's the causality direction. You know, you have to first understand your physics and then you can talk about information processing. Uh, if, you, if you come from the platonic direction of mathematics and you believe that these things exist up there independently of the physical world, you will strongly disagree with what I have to say. But luckily I know that all of you are physicists more or less and I think you are happily uh, going along with this statement. So now, what I, what I really said is that if you want to talk about quantum mechanics, all you need to be able to, uh, to address is you have a certain preparation of your system, which we call ALICE always because we view it as a communication. And then um, ALICE does something to prepare some state of her system, whatever this is. So she has a photon, she tries to make the photon horizontally polarized, she never quite does it with 100% efficiency because you can't do it. So either deliberately or, or accidentally, she prepares some mixed state row. And, and, and then this row undergoes some kind of evolution. And I said the most general evolution that this row can undergo is that it's called a completely positive map. But a physical way of thinking about it is that there is an environment which joins, uh, which joins your, your, your system, and then they act, they basically interact together, and then you don't look at the environment, you just look at the system, and this is this CP map, uh, completely positive trace preserving map, and then you get some other, some other state at the output row prime. And typically now, you want to see the effect of the evolution. So typically, you, you don't quite understand what this map is. You, you'd like to understand the system dynamics. You may like to understand the features of the environment and so on. And it's all sitting inside the CP maps. If you can really reconstruct the operators, the Krauss operators in this decomposition. So this was always of this form, uh, AI rho AI dagger. And if you have a complete description of these AIs, then you fully understand the dynamics of your system together even with the dynamics of your environment. Everything. This is the tomography, if you like, of, of your process. Um, and then ultimately, of course, for, for Bob, for the receiver to be able to do that, Bob needs to now measure this guy. And this is the beauty of this formulation. The measurement is just another CP map. So we're not now inventing there is no difference between evolution and measurement. That's what I'm saying. And that's very satisfying to every physicist because I don't like to have a process that's nice and clean, but then I, when I look at the system, suddenly something jumps. That really makes no sense. And this is the process number one and the process number two, as, as von Neumann called them. But if you talk about CP maps all the time, then everything becomes a process. Your measurement is another process. Everything is nice and physical. You don't have to go into any dogmatic interpretations of any nonsense and stuff like that. This is really the ultimate physics in that sense. Um, and so th this kind of measurement is also a CP map. Sometimes people call it PLVM. When you read it, you, you, because it's a positive operator valued measure. So it already, 
Th these initials already tell you that this is a positive operator and it gives you some value, it gives you some measure, which is a probability distribution in a fancy mathematical language. So this is just invented to, con con to confuse physicists, of course, but it means something very simple. And then depending on the outcomes of these measurements, so this is just another guy of this type. Okay, there will be some operators bi, and then Bob will effectively execute. So this is your state row prime, and Bob will effectively execute something like that. It all looks the same, and it is the same. Uh, and, and depending on the outcomes, Bob will start to try to infer what happened to the system in the in the middle. And I think this is now physics. There is nothing outside of this paradigm. I mean, if you understand that, if you know how to deal with that, you know how to do it. Um, and 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 I'd like to basically I'd like to give a few examples and I'd like to go through the through the two scenarios that I mentioned yesterday just to get you used to these things, and I think then we will start to translate directly the data compression, the noiseless and the noisy communication theorems of Shannon. And I hope to get at the end of uh, today's lecture to that. And I think then we move on to the things that you cannot even formulate in classical information theory, like dense coding, teleportation. And nice, uh, nice games like that. Again, most of you are familiar with this thing. Um, so, um, okay. So, so what's? I think I ended up discussing with with with, with few people from the audience yesterday uh, a very nice example, which which actually clears another uh, common misconception. Um, basically, this CP man, like I said, is 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 a general. So it, it includes unitary transformations, but it also includes noisy operations. Unitary transformations tend to preserve the mixedness of your state. If you think about entropy as the mixedness, so you'll, I'll have to be a little bit vague now because I haven't yet derived the entropy in quantum mechanical sense, and you will see it in probably like uh, I don't know half an hour time. But just you know, believe me that this is the way it is, and I think you will see how this works. So basically, unitary transformations tend to preserve your entropy, but then if you have something more general than unitary. There is a belief that your entropy should increase because noise adds to your entropy. But you have to remember this is only true for the whole universe. So this is true for the system plus the environment. If you look at the system only, then the entropy could actually go down. Lots of you are familiar with some of the arguments that evolution contradicts thermodynamics and is therefore not true. This is promoted by various sorts of people from various corners of this earth. And the argument is that life becomes more and more ordered and it clearly goes in the opposite direction of increasing entropy. But of course, life is not a closed system. And if you look at the Earth and the Sun together, you already can easily calculate. You can do a back of an envelope calculation that entropy always goes up. No matter how actively we try to decrease it, we can't do anything about it. But here is an example of that in terms of PRBMs, in terms of CP maps. So imagine you start from a completely mixed state of a two-level system. Imagine really an atom. I'm going to be using zeros and ones and excited and grounds just to get you used to all sorts of notations like that. It's all the same, of course. So you start with, let's say you start at a very high temperature, you know, and, and, and these two levels are equally populated. So again, you drive your density matrix as one half ground state plus one half excited state. As we learned yesterday, you just need to multiply uh, the two states written as operators with the probabilities for, for each of them to occur. And if you have something like the spontaneous emission, then all of you know that if I add the environment and I do the full treatment there, then I, will, I can derive the exponential decay of the excited state and everything will somehow end up in the ground state. But I only care about the end result of that. I'm not going to do the dynamics of that. I'm only going to show you the operators that do this this job for you. So basically what I want is I want at some later time t nothing to be in the excited state and everything to end up in the ground state. Now this looks like it's contradicting second law thermodynamics because I'm starting with maximum entropy, mixed state. I'm ending up with a pure state. Pure state has no entropy. Entropy is zero as you will see from the from the von Neumann definition of entropy. So somehow I've reduced the entropy by one bit. How can that be? Well, of course, it can be because I'm only looking at the system here. I'm not telling you what happened to the photon that got emitted 
So the environment picked up the bill, actually. And if you sum them up, you will see that the total thing actually increases. You can't change that fact. So there is no contradiction here uh, in that sense. But anyway, that wasn't the main point I wanted to make. The main point I want to make is just to show you how to write these guys. So if you say the operator A1, so obviously you have to ultimately, every, everything has to be forced into the ground state. So whichever state you start from, you want to always end up with the ground state. Remember that, that we're thinking from right to left now in the, in the Hebrew fashion of that, uh, of that uh, uh, basically logic. So if you're in the ground state, you do want to end up in the ground state. That's what spontaneous emission does. If you're in the excited state, you also want to end up in the ground state. I'm not telling you the mechanism of this. That's the beauty of that as well. I'm just capturing it as an operator. And now you can check that if you multiply this state, and if you compute A1 rho A1 dagger plus A2 rho A2 dagger, And I really leave it as an exercise because I don't want to waste your time and my time. You will really get the ground state. It's kind of obvious because when I input ground state, I will get a ground state from the first term. When I input the excited, I will again get the ground state. So both of these will give me the same thing and it's got to add up to the ground state on average. It's going to be 1 half g plus 1 half g, basically. Um, is this a valid uh, CP map? Uh, well, obviously, I'm already constructing it in this A dagger A form. But do they really sum up to 1? So does A1 dagger A1 plus A2 dagger A2, is that identity? And, and you can construct it, you know. This guy, of course, its emission conjugate is the same guy. It's a projection operator. So this guy is nothing but GG itself. Okay? The dagger of this guy is basically swap the bras and cats, and you get the EG. And now this times that, if you can see that in your mind's eye, as it were, will simply give you G times G is 1. And what's left is E times E. And this is, by definition, identity operator. So they are going to operate them. Uh, it's a sum of excited and ground states. So yes, it's all fine. Probability is concerned. Perfect exam question, by the way. You can do it in five minutes. And it's an easy example of, uh, of a completely positive math. So, um, so, so basically, just, just for, for, for those of you, I, I realize that there are many things I should be saying. It could be confusing to people who uh, who've never seen this before. That guy is an identity. And in fact, you call the whole thing a density matrix and everything else. Because it's very convenient. Dirac notation is so suggestive that you should write these guys as, as matrices. Because what you're really doing is you're doing something like, you know, you're giving me states like that, G, E, in general, something like E, G, and E, E. And you put some numbers in front of these guys. So it's very suggestive to say, well, if I label this guy as G, and this guy as E, and this guy as G conjugate, and this guy as E conjugate, then, then actually I can read off the elements of that. You know, here is the, here is the row G, G, the row E, G, or whatever, G, E, whichever order you like to take, you know, E, G, and Rho, E, E. And here they are, you know, Rho, G, G. So that's, that's basically why these two representations are, in fact, one and the same representation. So you, you tend to confuse the language. You, you talk about operators and matrices in the same way, whereas operators are the platonic guys, and matrices are just one of the low life implementations of operators. There are many others uh, that you can think of. Um, so basically, that's, that's the logic there. And this would be some kind of general form of a density matrix for a two-level two -level system. And of course, if you look at the sum of G and E, that immediately becomes an operator <coughs> 1, 0, 0, 1. 
and that's your identity matrix. So this would be the typical G. Again, most of you probably know this and are starting to fall asleep. So I'll start doing something slightly more exciting. So that's it. Now, what we really did uh, at the end of last lecture is we said, so what about communication scenarios? Where does this become relevant? Where do you really see these uh, more generalized measurements becoming more relevant than even projective measurements? And then I gave the example that, uh, that if you're trying to discriminate two states. So the scenario again is Alice has a photon. And for some reason, she prepares this photon in two different polarization states. So she tosses a coin. And if she gets uh, heads, imagine that she uh, prepares the photon in the state cos theta. So it's convenient to talk in terms of these angles because then trigonometry is nice and clean and you can write it down in a compressed way. And psi 1 is, is basically more or less the same coefficients, but with a negative phase between these guys. And in general, if you compute the inner product of these guys, these, they will not be orthogonal to one another. Um, so if you look at the inner product of these guys, then, then, then you get something like um, uh, cos times cos. So the cross terms disappear because of orthogonality, and you get cos squared minus uh, uh, sine squared, and that's uh, uh, something like cos twice the angle. Okay? All of you have probably seen this in the block sphere picture and everything else. Uh, now, how do I discriminate this as Bob? I know that Alice has either prepared this guy or that guy, and I really want to be as sure as I can possibly be that, uh, that of, of her message. And, and the question is, what's the best? And the, What's the best depends on what you want the best to be, in some sense. You have to define for me what exactly would you like your strategy to do. And I said two different strategies. The, the, the most obvious strategy is I'm just going to maximize the probability of the correct guess. So again, if you like the picture, I'm going to do the usual vector space picture, which is not quite the block picture. It's the block picture divided by two in some sense. So orthogonal states in my picture are really orthogonal, rather than being in the diametrically opposite directions of the block sphere. If that means anything to you. If it doesn't, forget about it completely. So here are your two states that you can discriminate fully, two orthogonal. There are my zeros and ones there. And what I'm doing now is I'm actually preparing a state which is some kind of superposition cos theta 0 plus sine theta 1. It's exactly like ordinary uh, linear algebra. I think we all know this nice and, nice and well, actually. And, and the other state is the same, but with a minus sign, when theta goes into minus theta. You know? So he, he is this, uh, here is this state. So this state would be psi 0, and this state would be psi 1. What's the best measurement that I can execute? to discriminate them, providing that I'm happy to make an error. I'm happy to be mistaken, but I want to minimize my mistake. The best thing to do is to measure in the 45 degrees minus 45 degrees polarization. You can prove this formula. So basically, what happens there is that you make the measurement in the plus. Sometimes this is called the plus basis. So this would be 0 plus 1. And this guy, orthogonal to it, you can already see that I'm, that I'm drawing it very badly, actually. But this guy is 0 minus 1, divided by root 2. I'm, I'm omitting the normalization now. I'm too lazy. Someone said that this way of writing states without normalization is the biggest contribution of computer science to physics, if not the only contribution. I tend to agree with that, actually. Very um, so here is a nice way of doing these things. Now, um, it's all on the record, actually. It's very bad. If, uh, <laughs> I hope you won't be putting it there uh, very quickly. Anyway, um, so what do you do now? Well, if your outcome is psi plus, all is nice. And you say, I'm guessing that Alice sent psi zero. If your outcome is psi minus, they occur with equal probability because it's symmetric. It's somehow clear that the optimum has got to be symmetric. If you're asking me, why is it not the measurement in the 0, 1 basis? Then somehow 0, 1 basis favors one state over the other. You can see that it's not going to do anything for you. If you get 0, it exists here as well with the same probability. 
So how can you discriminate the states? The same with one. You actually cannot discriminate them at all in the zero one basis. So it's the stupidest thing to do. But if you rotate it to the complement, that turns out to be the most intelligent one to do. So what's the probability of error in this case? Or the probability of success they have to add up to, to, to unity. So the probability of error is that your input state was psi 1, but you projected it to, psi, uh, to plus state. So psi 1 comes in with a half probability on its own. And then you have to compute the probability that you are in psi 1, but you project it to psi plus. The Bohm rule tells you that this is the mod square of the overlap of these guys. So nice and easy. There's nothing unusual here. And then you've got another half, and you've got psi 0, psi minus state. Another typical exact question. So anything that's nice and easy, and I can derive it here without thinking about it too much, is a nice and easy question for you. Like, uh, you shouldn't be driven by exams, obviously. But it's good to know what kind of stuff uh, we'd be expecting. So now here is the probability to make an error. And it's very nice and easy, because making an overlap of psi plus, with the, the state plus with psi 1, <coughs> plus is just a, a combination of, of 0 and 1 with a plus sign there. So it's easy to multiply 0 by 0 and 1 by, by 1. So if you really want this, this becomes 1 half. Okay? And now you get the state plus, basically, multiplying this guy with a minus sign. So that's going to be something like cos theta minus sine theta and then square, mod square. Given that I've chosen deliberately real numbers, you can even forget about the mod here. And you can say this is just cos theta minus sine theta all squared. And then we should pay tribute to computer scientists and say, say that there's a half missing because I forgot 1 over root 2 and 1 over root 2 squared, if you're mathematically minded, is 1 half. There's an extra 1 half. That's actually how you do calculations. You ignore all the normalizations, you derive your final result, you see that it makes no sense, and you divide it until it starts to make sense. <laughs> That's how I behave in a foreign country when I don't know the ratio of the currencies. I just divide until the price starts to make sense. And it's usually a good rule of thumb. Now, here it's the same, and in fact, because of symmetry, I don't even have to calculate this guy. I know it's got to be the same. So it's exactly like multiplying this guy uh, the same. I don't want to calculate it because it is the same, so it's basically multiplying this by 2, if you like. So your final result then is something like 1 half, and then the, the so if you want really to write it uh, a little bit more intelligently, you can expand it, and you've got cos squared plus sine squared is 1, and then you've got minus 2 times cos sine, which actually is just sine 2 theta. Okay? Here is your final result, probability to make a mistake. If you want to write it in terms of the overlap, because I keep saying that this is actually the quantity that matters, how distinguishable they are, then sine of 2 theta is just the square root of 1 minus the cos squared. So if you want in terms of that, this becomes 1 half 1 minus square root of 1 minus the overlap squared between these quantities. I'm calling this now the overlap between these two. Actually, I should choose another letter. It looks very much like zero, and that doesn't make sense. Call it epsilon, OK? What if the states are orthogonal? Epsilon is zero. One minus one is zero. You cannot make a mistake. You've got to be able to discriminate them. That's the classical limit. That's the only value of epsilon that gives you classical physics. The infinity in between is quantum mechanics. Everything in between is really a qubit. You cannot do these things with classical, with classical states. That's one scenario. And you're not surprised because you're seeing this mod square of the overlap. So the main quantity really becomes psi 0, psi 1, mod square. And you can say I've known this all along, actually. I mean, that's the bond posture. It's written a little bit differently. Now, the interesting case. So this is projective measurement. No surprises there. The interesting case is if you say, I don't want to make a mistake. I want to know 
when I cannot guess, and then I'm going to shut up. And if I can't guess, I want to be sure that I guessed correctly. And this requires three outcomes. And exactly what we said yesterday is that, of course, they cannot be projective measurements because my system is only a two-level system. So I can't do that. So now I need something like A1 to tell me definitely that I have one of the states. And I said one way of doing this is to project onto the orthogonal state to one of these states. So say I project onto the orthogonal state of psi 1. The only way that this can happen is if I have psi 0. There's no way that I can be in the state psi 1. I only send psi 1, and suddenly I get the outcome orthogonal to psi 1. This is zero probability. So if I get this outcome, I'm sure that, I, that the state that Alice prepared must have been psi, psi 0. Now I do the other way around, and I exclude psi 0 like that. So the 1 minus the projector means it's not in this state, right? I mean, this is the negation in quantum mechanics, if you think about it. Now, this makes you think that it's this state. You sum them up, and you get a number bigger than 1. And you say, that's not trans trace preserving. It's not the CP map. I can't do that. It would be great if I could discriminate them fully like that. But we know we cannot. It's got to be a third outcome. And the third outcome is what? Well, first of all, these guys have to be divided by something. Because otherwise, they're never going to sum up to 1. They're always going to overshoot 1. And I'll give you the answer without really boring you again with all the details. What you have to divide it by is 1 plus the overlap between the two states. Epsilon is exactly the same epsilon as the 1 over there. And if you do the same symmetrically, of course, here, all a I should call it A0 in a sense. It's a bad one. I can't, I can't say anything about it. Is that this is 1. It's the easiest way of making it somehow to identity. 1 minus this guy minus that guy. Okay? If I do something like that, I've got three outcomes to my measurement. Of course, physically, this really means, like I said yesterday, you have to bring in an ancilla. You have to bring another system, couple your system to that other system, and that's the only way you can execute it. You can't do this on its own on the system. And now you say, what about the probability? What about the probability of error in this case? Okay. So the probability to make an error now. Again, I don't want to bore you. I will write it down what it is by definition. So to make, I mean, there are no errors now, as such. What it means now, probability to make an error is probability not to be able to say anything. Okay, so maybe I should put P0 saying this is the one where I cannot make, this is the unsuccessful outcome. And this, of course, is always the same formula. It's the trace of that operator times the state itself. And the state, we already have it there, right? This is just one half psi 0. That's what Alice sends. 50 50 psi 0 and psi 1. That's it. Two non orthogonal states. What's, the, what's this number? And you know, you can now decompose it. Trace of rho minus trace of a1 rho minus, and you can do your multiplications, inner products, and so on. The interesting thing, for me at least it's interesting, that's how boring I am actually, this becomes epsilon, not epsilon squared. Okay. Now, I've only had one guy comment on that, and I have nothing more intelligent to say about it, but there's got to be something more intelligent in it. This is the only place where the amplitude comes out from an operational physical measurement procedure, not the mod square of the amplitude. Okay? Of course, I chose a real number. If that wasn't a real number, I would have to choose the modulus of that. But it's not the modulus squared. It's the modulus that gives you the probability of error. Again, it checks out. If these are orthogonal states, then this is 0, and you never get this third outcome. You can always discriminate them perfectly. These guys then become perfect projectors. All of this is 1 now, no problem, OK? The, the, the special case. The other extreme, of course, is when these guys are 1 in the same state, 
the overlap is one, in which case you can never say anything because Alice is always sending you the same state. I mean, how can you discriminate it from itself? So that also makes sense. But this is the case where the amplitude matters, not the amplitude. We keep saying, take the mod squared. That's the only thing that makes sense. Not true, actually. This guy also makes sense. Does this have certain other implications? I have no idea. But John Wheeler was the only person I had ever say something about it. Actually, I lie a little bit. There's a guy called Max Born who got a Nobel Prize in the following way. He wrote his paper, the Born Rule paper, which in the main text says this. He says the probability to get the outcome is equal to this guy. That's what it says in the paper. Then he receives the proofs of the paper. He puts the footnote and says on closer inspection, it's actually the mod square that's the probability. And this footnote is the Nobel Prize winning footnote. This is the least effort I know. So he even makes a mistake in the original paper. But actually, the footnote corrects it, and that's enough to get a Nobel Prize. I think it's a very cool way of getting Nobel Prizes. <laughs> but this is the only other scenario, in some sense, which is not a mistake in this case, where this, where this really starts to matter. Now, now I'd like to do the, the interesting bit uh, for the remaining part of this. And I think I've got a few minutes to set it up, and then we'll, then we'll do it. So basically, this was a single shot scenario, as people like to call it, in the sense that Alice prepares a single photon in some, some way, sends it to Bob, nothing happens along the way, and Bob then has to figure out the preparation procedure of Alice. In real life, in physics, Alice is also Bob at the same time. It's the same experimentalist who prepares the system, waits for a little bit, and then measures the system. So that applies to that scenario, obviously, by definition. Now, um, what I want to investigate is what happens if Alice keeps doing that many times. So rather than just sending one of these states row, she prepares another photon, then another photon, and then n photons. And now this is the equivalent of randomly tossing a coin, if you like, getting zeros and ones, and then waiting for 100 of these zeros and ones, and then asking yourself, do I have to send all of these 100 quantum bits in this case to Bob. This is known as data compression. And what we are going to discover is that you actually don't need to do that. And the derivation is exactly the same as the derivation we had before. And that's the beautiful bit. And I will get to it in a, in a moment. So basically the question is, can I do this with some other state, rho prime, but can I use a smaller number and how much smaller? Of course, the answer is going to be that n is n times the entropy of this state. But I want to show you how to, how to, derive, how to derive this. One way of seeing it is the following. This state is, is your usual. Again, let's stick to just two, two states that are communicated. And you can see immediately that it generalizes to any number of, of states. Since I can personally diagonalize only two by two matrices, that's the only thing I'm ever going to ask of you as well. Uh, the rest becomes much more complicated actually to, to solve higher order polynomials, if you like. So basically, here is row 1. And then I've got another copy of the same row 1. Okay? And then I've got another copy and so on. Okay? So what does it matter that I have more copies now? So what matters is that Alice can, of course, do collective operations on all of this. And I will describe actually what kind of operation she does. This was first, this is actually how quantum information theory started with a guy called Ben Schumacher. And in this paper, he basically submitted the paper in 92, I think, or 93. The referee thrashed it. Ben Schumacher said, I couldn't care less. I'm cool. I'm not even going to argue with the guy. So he doesn't even resubmit it. Then Arthur Eckert is invited to write a commentary for Nature on this rejected paper, how good the paper is. After which Ben Schumacher says, maybe I should write the paper and resubmit it, actually, because it probably is a very good paper if it's reviewed in Nature. So the paper finally comes out in 95. And that's the one containing the name qubit for the first time in the direct analog of the bit in Shannon's information theory. So this is known as Schumacher's data compression. So once I, I introduced Schumacher to someone and I said, 
this is the guy uh, who actually invented qubits. And he said, that's wrong. God invented qubits. I only named them. Okay, so this is the, the logic here. I think he follows fully the physicist's logic of who did what and who invented what. Now, I want to expand this a little bit just to show you that it's very similar to the zero one one case. The only tricky bit is that these guys are not orthogonal to each other. And I think as soon as I say this to you, most of you will say, why don't you diagonalize it? Why don't you make it orthogonal, in which case it reduces itself to the classical case? And yes, that's what you need to do for this guy. So it's very easy. But basically, what I want to show you is just that this is a combination of all possible sequences, in the same way that we have combinations of zeros and ones before. So you know, there is a sequence which contains all size zeros. See how lazy I am now. I'm removing not only the tensor product, but I'm removing the cats and bras and everything else. Okay, but this really means the same thing now. And n qubits all in the state size zero. This occurs with the probability one over two to the power of n. Then you've got states where you've got n minus one size zero and one size one in different places. Okay, there are n states like that. Okay, there's one state like this n, then n choose two blah, 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 n choose n, that's it. The usual distribution like in classical. So, but of course they're non-orthogonal, which is a very bad thing because that means I cannot discriminate this state from that state fully. And that's the problem with compression. So it's not a good basis to work with. And this brings me to this very important issue of basically the fact that if you rotate this into another basis, and the, the best basis is the diagonal basis, because these guys are orthogonal, they're the eigenstates. Then you will have effectively a bunch of mixed states of bits, and your compression has exactly the same result as before. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably make a, make a short, short break just after writing down what we do, and then I will show you in a little bit more detail how this works. So again, I'm going to use typical sequences, the ones that are more likely to be occurring than others, but for that you need to rewrite your row in a diagonal basis. So you need to have some kind of R1 probability for the eigenstate R1 and R2 probability for the eigenstate R2 and you have that R1, R2 is equal to zero. This is, these are the eigenstates. So again, most of you have hopefully seen this kind of stuff. This description is identical to that description in the sense that you cannot discriminate which of the descriptions you have in nature. All infinitely many of them are identical. That's an important point that I'm going to actually address in the, next, in the next lecture. So I'm not making any mistake by rewriting it differently. I'm not giving you more information. They all happen to be the same. And this has a very important uh, consequence. And the consequence is that quantum mechanics is a fully local theory. I will also tell you in which sense it's local. Not in the bell inequality sense, but in the sense that locality has the original meaning of that word. So now, how do these R1 and R2 relate to the epsilon that I actually erased, unfortunately, now? So somehow I have to relate these guys to the overlap of psi 0 and psi 1. But all this means is how do you diagonalize a density matrix. And I'm going to stop now and I'm going to start with that because I believe most of you know how to do it and you'll feel very happy that I'm confirming uh, some of the knowledge that you have. So 10 minute break, yeah? So what, what I'd like to continue with is exactly where we stopped and, and, and again address this issue of quantum noiseless data compression, if you like. And, um, and what, uh, what, what the question really is, is, is if Alice sends, uh, I'm choosing deliberately this one half here to make it very easy to compute. You can think of P0 associated with one state and P1 with, with the other one. But if she chooses them equally likely, then you can see immediately the difference between quantum and classical compression. If these were classical bits, they would be maximally mixed and you couldn't compress them. So
So the question, the, the statement would be there is no way to compress a classical message like that. And you will see that this will be confirmed, of course, when these guys are orthogonal. But, but if you have a quantum, a quantum, uh, a genuinely quantum channel, if you like, on quantum states that you use as signals, then they are non orthogonal in general. And, and then, of course, you cannot, um, you cannot compress them in this way. You cannot even try to compress them in this way. And then I said, the best thing to do is to diagonalize the matrix and look at it in another decomposition. And there is a statement which is very important in quantum mechanics that, that any decomposition of a density matrix is, is the same in the sense of giving you the same results experimentally. So if I give you a density matrix that I prepared in one way, and then I give you a density matrix that I prepared in another way, but it gives me the same overall matrix. And here are the examples, you know. I toss a coin, <coughs> and with half probability I prepare this, and with half I prepare that. Or I toss another coin which is biased in this R1 and R2 ways, and we'll describe it in a minute what they are. They're basically 1 plus cos, 1 minus cos, if you really want to know now. Then these guys uh, can be prepared by me tossing the coin. If I get this outcome, I prepare this state. And if I get this guy, I prepare that state. On average, when you sum them up, it's exactly the same density matrix. And the statement is, if I give this to you, and I tell you, how did I prepare the guy? Did I use procedure A or B? You cannot do this, in principle. Practice, whichever one, but in principle. So that means that, means that, that actually, whichever way you choose to expand your density matrix is indistinguishable. And I, like I said, this is going to be very important because if you could do that, you could really communicate instantaneously between two uh, faraway parties. And that, of course, violates locality. And quantum mechanics is a local theory. I've got a diffusion equation, a diffusion <laughs> equation propagating state nice and slowly. So if I want to do something over there, I've got to be going myself over there and then fiddling with it. There is no magic in quantum mechanics. No matter what you think about Bell's inequalities and whatever, quantum mechanics is as boring as classical physics in the sense of locality. It really is. <coughs> of course, it's unusual, but there is no magic. You can't do things at a distance. And this inability to discriminate the decomposition is the key. And I'll do it next time, because I start talking about entanglement, and now with the whole machinery of uh, CP maps, I will prove this to you in three lines. And it's amazingly mysterious. Sorry I'm digressing now. I find this a beautiful topic, actually. And this uh, uh, you know, liberal way of giving lectures is ideal for this kind of stuff. This is a mystery, because whoever constructed quantum mechanics initially could not care less about special relativity. It's nothing to do with special relativity. Yes, it was merged into field theory later, but the non-relativistic quantum mechanics doesn't know anything about action at the distance. It shouldn't know about it. But what I'm going to prove to you is that it does. How come? How come these two completely different descriptions, completely different domains, do actually somehow consistently talk to each other? That's true of many physical theories, by the way. If you violate one small aspect of one theory, to me this is actually a very beautiful topic and with deep significance, somehow you end up violating the whole of physics. It's really very closely knit and very tight. So if, if you, for example, manage to discriminate non-orthogonal states with perfect efficiency, then you can immediately show that not only can you communicate faster than the speed of light, but you can also violate the second law of thermodynamics. You can go in the opposite direction of the total entropy. <coughs> Again, why should this be the case? Thermodynamics should not care about quantum mechanics. Neither should relativity, actually. And yet, they do know about each other. You know, is this the unity of nature? Is that because we are describing one and the same thing out there? Who knows? But it's an interesting topic. Now, how do I write this guy down? Well, let's do it from the mixture that I started with. Let, let me write psi zero as a density matrix first. And psi zero was just basically something that I used to have down there, but I no longer have it. Anyway, psi zero, if I write it again, was a cos theta zero plus sine theta one. And, and zero and one are really orthogonal states. I'm using some kind of basis, horizontal and vertical polarization of light, if you like to think of it in that way. And of course, if you write this as a density matrix from what I said before, 
you can read off the elements. If you do the conjugate and then multiply them out, and you will see that this looks like cos squared theta, sine squared theta, great. Trace preserving, they sum up to 1. And then you've got cos sine, cos theta, sine theta, which is the sine of the, you know, half the sine of the twice the angle. Let's leave it like this for the moment. Sine theta. So here is a here is a two by two matrix which describes your state psi zero. Um, again, you can see that it traces one, you can see that it's Hermitian if you exchange these guys uh, and conjugate them, which is irrelevant, they're real, you get exactly the same matrix. You can also check the positivity by checking the eigenvalues, which we're going to do in a second. Um, psi one. It's the same thing, but basically the only difference is that sine theta comes with a negative phase, with a negative, with minus 1 in front of it. And basically this looks like this, cos squared. I'm really going in a very, most of you have probably done this a million times, and you can do it in your sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. So basically, minus sine here, um, and, and then you've got the same guy here, um, and then you've got sine squared. Again, clearly trace preserving um, and clearly Hermitian uh, operator. And now I have to take one half of psi zero plus one half of psi one, and that again is, uh, is, uh, is very nice and, uh, nice and easy. So basically what I do is I, uh, so rho, if you really write it as a, as a density matrix here, is one half of this guy, but this is the same guy. So I always have cos squared theta here and sine squared theta over here. So again, psi 1 is cos theta 0 minus sine theta 1. And basically the, uh, the off-diagonal elements which I, which, I can now, which I can now just combine in this case. Uh, so basically this is, the, this, is the density, this is the density matrix as we have it. And, uh, and basically what I do is I'm, I'm just combining one half of this guy plus one half of that guy. And somehow I have a sign mistake, which I shouldn't. Uh, it's good looking in real time because uh, I slow down so you can catch up as well if you're, if you're missing. So basically I'm missing something because this guy should not, um, should not sum up to zero. Um, uh, which is good. Sorry. So it is very different to the. I was trying to link it to the plus minus discrimination. In this case, we do really get zero, and these guys are not equal to a half. So in, in a sense, this is the trivial case. In which, in which the, we diagonalize my stuff. I was thinking of the case when we exchange the amplitudes of these guys, and then it becomes a little bit more exciting exercise. But it's great because I can ask you this to do on Monday. Okay, so this is the easy one. I got lucky here. So basically, what this says now is I've got a diagonal matrix which has cos squared theta. This is the zero zero entry, if you like, plus sine squared theta one one entry. Actually, it's great. It's diagonal in the 0, 1 basis. If you exchange them, it will be diagonal in the complementary basis. So now, what this says is that mixing psi 0 and psi 1 equally, this guy here, is exactly the same as if I really threw a coin with outcomes cos squared and sine squared guys, and then I prepared the state 0 and state 1. This exactly is the same density matrix. But notice that cos squared in general is not the same as sine squared. And that's actually why the data compression will now do the job. So the statement now is that instead of looking at this sequence of density matrices, I might as well look at cos squared theta 0 plus sine squared theta 1. Again, the next guy comes in exactly the same way. And I've converted uh, a problem that involves non-orthogonal states into a problem that involves orthogonal states. And now we're back in business because this is the classical Shannon scenario. So it's as if Alice is really choosing orthogonal states, but the probabilities are not 50-50. 
And that's where the quantum mechanics is encoded. Non-orthogonal states go into orthogonal ones, but with different weights rather than the 50-50. And if you now ask yourself, how much can I compress? We already derived that the entropy, Shannon entropy of this guy, is, is simply equal to minus cos squared theta log cos squared theta. So it's P log P. Minus sin, sin squared theta log sine squared theta. So again, unless, unless you have really the trivial case, in which case these guys are orthogonal to start with, okay? So that means this inner product, which I call the uh, cos twice the, so the inner product here is, is simply cos squared, uh, cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. If this guy is zero and they're orthogonal to start with, then again, this guy is going to be zero and this guy is going to be zero because it's one times log one and the whole thing basically tells you that, that you have one and the same state if you like in that name. The other extreme is when they are both equal to a half and in this case, of course, you get one bit of information which is the case of, of, equal, uh, of equal amplitudes. But in general, that the range in between for non-trivial theta, if you like, um, for theta between 0 and pi by 2, what you will get is something that's smaller than 1. So this is always less than or equal to 1. This was the statement that I made before that, that quantum mechanics, the capacity of your channel in quantum mechanics is always upper bounded by the corresponding classical capacity. So the classical capacity, which is the one when they are orthogonal, is in this case of a single bit equal to one, if you like, one per bit. But quantum mechanically, because these guys are non-orthogonal, you get something that's generally smaller than that, because of these probabilities not being equal. And again, you are allowed to do this transformation simply because this sequence of bits, the state here, is completely indistinguishable from this sequence of bits. That's just as simple as, as that. Um, and now if you say, well, how do I actually generalize this result? Um, you, the only thing you have to do is really add more states. So in general, you'd be starting with some density matrix, which would have probabilities pi and some state psi i. And I could now go from 1 to any number n. You'd have to be able to diagonalize this matrix. Again, like I said, if you're not talking about two by two matrices, then you know if you go to whatever, five by five, you can't even do it analytically, if you like. Uh, basically, as long as you can convert this guy, so in fact, it's even equal to some kind of orthogonal decomposition. So these R's are really eigenstates uh, of your, would be different in general, actually. Eigenstates of your system, then, the formula is simply the Shannon formula for this. So your compression is equal to minus uh, sum over i, r i, log r i. So these eigen, eigenvalues are exactly the probabilities in the Shannon compression case. So it was actually very easy. Once, once, once Schumer had figured out that all he needs to do is look at the density matrix that's composed of non-orthogonal states, in, a, in its diagonal form, then it reduces itself to Shannon's compression case, and I think you don't have any, uh, any problem to start with. And again, the justification of why you would be doing this, it's very difficult to see if you want to convey lots of information why you'd be doing that, because you're reducing the, the capacity. But of course, non-orthogonality makes it more difficult for anyone else to read this message, and I think the main motivation really comes from, uh, from eavesdropping. Um, and this is why you would be doing something like that. Okay, now if this is, if this is more or less clear, then, um, so, so now the question is, what exactly is this von Neumann entropy? And you can see it from this pres prescription. So what pre people frequently call this is they say uh, quantum data <coughs> compression. Um, and what they say is instead of using n bits, you can actually use n times the entropy of your message qubit. Okay? 
So this is this uh, short uh, hand way of talking about a function of, a, of an operator. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that just because it may not be entirely obvious what this means. So basically, this guy is simply defined as minus trace of rho log rho. So it's a very similar form because the sum in the classical case, you know, pi log pi, the sum is something that quantum mechanically becomes the trace, and probability is quantum mechanically upgraded to a density matrix. If you think of a probability distribution being your catalog of knowledge classically, then quantumly it's the density matrix. That's the description of the system. And amazingly enough, if you want a very dirty way of translating any classical information quantity into quantum, all you ever need to do is replace sums by traces and replace probabilities by density matrices. I swear it works. You can write infinitely many papers now. It always happens to be the case that this really works out nicely. You can justify from x other directions if you really want to do it. So, of course, again to remind you, what does it mean to take a log of a matrix? What does it mean to take any function of the matrix, function of, of, of rho? What it means, mathematically speaking, is diagonalize the row and then take the function of the eigenvalues. And, and you can see how this corresponds to doing this basis change. This is exactly the, the same as the mathematical procedure. So basically, write row in its eigenbasis, and then it becomes like classical functions. I mean, once, this, once I have an orthogonal basis, then I'm pretending that I'm in the classical regime. I don't have any non-orthogonality to worry about. And all I then do, so this is by definition now, that's how it's defined, is the sum of i, f of r i. Now I don't have a problem. I'm taking a function of a number. That's all we ever do anyway. But it's still an operator, r i times r. So I don't touch the eigenstates. I only look at the eigenvalues. This is in general true, whatever the function. Log is one of these examples. So let me just show you how this density matrix, so if you start with a combination of these guys, you get something that's already diagonal. So all you're doing is taking the trace. I'm really doing this in a pedestrian way just in case you've never seen it before. So sine squared theta, and then you've got the log of the same guy. So a cos squared theta, sine squared theta, 0, 0. And what this says is just take the log of the eigenvalues, but leave it in that matrix form, leave it in that basis. So this is, this is basically equal to uh, the same guy here. I'll, I'll shorten it to c, c squared and cos and, 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 and s squared. And then I've got it multiplied by the log of c squared log of s squared 0, 0. Of course, there's a minus sign that I keep forgetting. By now, hopefully, you're used to these things. And, and, and I'm also neglecting the trace. The trace just means the sum of the diagonal elements. So basically, you will see that this is already diagonal. So what I'm getting as the result is minus c squared log c squared minus s squared log S squared, which is what I claim to be the channel capacity. Here's the von Neumann entropy. And here's a, a mysterious way of talking about it. This was very intriguing to me when I, when I started doing my PhD. Think of entropy as the uncertainty of your state. Okay. So what is the classical uncertainty about the state that I have here? Well, I have a half a chance of psi 0 and half a chance of psi 1. Classical uncertainty is one bit. I have one bit uncertainty as to which state I got. What about the von Neumann entropy? What's the uncertainty? It's smaller. Who says that quantum mechanics has extra uncertainty? It's cleaner than classical physics. It's less uncertain. What uncertainty principle are you talking about? It's interesting, right? So quantum noise it's actually always less than, that's, that's a mysterious way of talking about the data compression. Von Neumann entropy is always smaller than the corresponding Shannon entropy. They are only the same if they are diagonal in the same basis, so to speak. If you get lucky and it's already diagonalized. 
So it's very interesting. It's, it's something that, again, uh, may not intuitively make complete sense. And of course, now you can generalize this to any number of states and so on. But I want to make it to the theorem number two, and I want to state it in all its generality as far as we know now. And then we've translated channel, and then we can say this is only a small portion of what we can do, and then, of course, we continue tomorrow to do the rest of these guys. Um, this was considered by this guy called Holleber. I think the year is 1972 or 73, and what he said is, what if I have some noise? So what if Alice does actually prepare states psi1, psi2, whatever, psi n. Now I'm really writing the same as what I wrote down at the end of the first day. Um, so I mix these guys, I send them with some average state, if you like, and, and they go through a channel, and the channel does something to these states. And this something, of course, you already know is a CP map. So I know that I, I'm not talking anymore about n by n matrix. I'm talking about some kind of CP map that affects these guys. I can always write it like that. And I don't actually care what this is. All I care about is that psi 1 is in general going to come out as some mixed state. It's not going to be pure, most likely, unless your CP map is a unitary transformation, which is, of course, noiseless quantum mechanical speed. It's going to come out as row 1. It's going to come out as row 2. It's going to come out as row n. OK? And now, Holebo, it's a very difficult problem, actually. I'll try to write it in a way that it becomes at least intuitively obvious what, what he did. And I think with the previous discussion that we had in mind, this will become believable. But actually, the full proof is, is, is anything but, uh, but easy. So his task now is, what is the best measurement that I can make here to discriminate between general and different density matrices? So once he solved how to discriminate two non-orthogonal states, he probably wasn't very happy with that. He said, oh, I can do better than that. Why don't I have n completely mixed states and see how to, uh, how to discriminate these guys? So you want to make some kind of measurement, again, with n different uh, outcomes. And if you get a1 outcome, you want to conclude that you had this state, which going backwards means that Alice sent that state. So that's the most general that we can do if I'm trying to stay close to the scenario that, uh, that classical information suggests. You can say to me, hey, what are you doing? Why don't you spread some entanglement between these two guys? We know you can do much uh, more funky things than this. Yes, you can. And yes, we will do it tomorrow. But I'm trying to use the rules that are only allowed in classical information other than the signals being non-orthogonal. So I'm really trying to derive the analog of, of Shannon. And of course, you can go beyond that into questions that don't even have the analog. And most of them don't, actually. That's the point. So, so how do you discriminate that? So basically, if you average over these guys, what Bob really receives is average of pi rho i. So he doesn't know which of these states Alice sent. And these are the guys that emerge with these probabilities. And this is what, on average, Bob sees. And now he has to measure it. You can see that it's exactly the same problem we considered before. It's just much harder to come up with a, with a bound now, especially that the, the question I'm phrasing it is not in a single shot scenario, but if this is done in the large number of communications limit. And that's really the difficulty here. If you had a single shot scenario, people have solved this for two different states. This is not. Two different mixed states with different probabilities. We know how to discriminate them. But if you go into the asymptotics, it's very difficult to show what this is. But again, we know the answer to that. So now, uh, let, me, let me argue a little bit what the answer is in a, in a, in a hand-waving way, and then I'll show you really how to, how to, at least I'll sketch out how to do that. So remember when we talked about classical channel capacity, we said that there was this quantity called mutual information which talks about it. So there was entropy of x and entropy of y and entropy of x, y together. 
And then I said there was another way of writing this, um, which, which, is, which is basically to say the entropy of y minus the entropy of y if I know what x is. OK? And I want, to, I want to look at the quantum analog of the second guy. Much easier than the first guy. I'll show you the first guy. I'll show you that they're the same in this case. But I want to look at the second guy and translate this mutual information into quantum mechanics. So I'm going to be doing lots of hand waving now, but hopefully you will buy, you will buy the, the resulting argument. First of all, the entropy of the output is clearly, according to this logic, the von Neumann entropy of the state rho. That really is just minus trace of rho log rho. This is the uncertainty of the total mass that Bob receives and has to unravel. Imagine that Bob somehow gets lucky and he looks at x. x in this case means one of these guys here. He looks at x and he says, oh, this guy is 1, has an index 1 then he immediately knows that the output state has got to be rho 1, okay? So if you condition this guy, so this guy quantum mechanically looks like S of rho, the conditional guy looks like the entropy of rho i. If I know i here, I know the uncertainty in rho i. But what's the average amount of uncertainty that I have over all possible probabilities? It's just sum over pi, this guy. That's the quantum analog of the conditional entropy. And you take the difference, and this is known as the Hollego bound. And it is the channel capacity. You can formally show it. So, so you just have to be careful in how to translate if you translate this in another way, and this may be a topic for some other interesting discussions, and there was a question already about this earlier, you may get a negative quantity. This quantity is always positive. It's average of, of, of entropies. It's never negative. But if you are not careful with this, you can actually generalize it in a way that it starts to become negative. And then it's very, very difficult to say what it means that my uncertainty is negative. I mean, my uncertainty can be zero if I'm that certain. But what does it mean I have negative uncertainty? I mean, this really is very difficult to interpret. I mean, there are some papers and so on, but it's not so easy to interpret this. So here is the whole of a bound. And now you say, can you actually write it like that? Yes, you can. And you have to go into, into an extended picture. And I'll just show you that one, because then it becomes even, even, even clearer why this is the case. Imagine that now I don't just write Bob's output. But imagine that I write the states that Alice sends here. So imagine that Alice prepares state 1 here, state 2, state 3. These are the different messages. So what, what, uh, what Bob is really trying to figure out is whether Alice is sending you know, yes, no, maybe, and whatever else Alice is sending there. So he wants to recover the classical message. That's why we're still in the, in the, in the Shannon scenario. And, and what this means is that if you really extend the state to cover Bob and Alice at the same time, your rho A, B state looks something like PI. Alice prepares message I with probability PI. But what Bob receives because of the noise in the channel and the encoding is a state rho I. So the first guy is Alice's state. The second guy is Bob's state. If I chase out Alice, I'll get this state on average. So if I chase out Alice of rho AB, I will really get Bob's state. That's how I know that this is the right generalization, or at least it's, it's, it's not a, it doesn't contradict the fact that this is the right uh, generalization. So Alice is trying to communicate some messages. Each of them is encoded in a quantum state. Then this guy suffers some noise. I get output of these guys. And here is the total state of Alice and Bob. You can think of this guy sitting in Alice's head. You know, Alice says, I want to send zero. What do I do? Uh -huh. I prepare psi zero, I send it through the channel, it becomes rho zero, and so on. So that's the logic. That's the logic of this. And now you ask yourself, what's the mutual information in this state? 
technology. Now you can legitimately compute quantum mutual information. You don't have to worry about it. So basically, what is the mutual information in the state rho A, B? That's the entropy of rho A plus the entropy of rho B, the same as, 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 as Shannon, but now with density matrices, minus entropy of rho A, B. And believe it or not, this comes out to be the whole of guy. So the logic is always the same. Channel capacity is a synonymous word for how correlated is Alice's message with Bob's output. That's all there is to it. How much can you correlate the sender and the receiver? And if you compute the mutual information, which tells you how correlated they are, you will really get the channel capacity. And it's the same result that Hollywood derived. Okay? How did he derive it? By brute force. What he had to do is he had to really come up with an with a intelligent choice of these guys to show that when he infers the state, he can really infer it at the rate that's shown here. He really had to show that the information that this measurement carries when, when, uh, when affecting this state that it carries about these guys is exactly uh, approached in the asymptotic limit and it goes towards this state here. So it's a very, it's a brute force calculation. The good news, and this is really the good news always in the asymptotic limit, you don't have to do the best possible measurement. And what people tend to do is something that they call a pretty good measurement. So actually almost any measurement, because you're going into the asymptotic case, will asymptotically be able to uh, discriminate these states. And the logic is that in the asymptotics, two states become more and more orthogonal. So ultimately, this almost becomes like a classical projective measurement. And in fact, you can get away with a projective projective measurement. So the logic is that you know if you have a star, 